You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. My guest, Bobby Capucci, has his own podcast, The Jeffrey Epstein Show, where he reports daily on all the news concerning Jeffrey Epstein. Welcome, Bobby Capucci. Hello, Roberta. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for doing this. So what got you interested in this story? Well, at first, the whole entire idea for me was the government corruption angle. I have seen family and friends get absolutely destroyed by the FBI with RICO charges as far as so-called illegal gambling goes. So when I saw this case for a start and I saw that the plea deal and all of the other things surrounding him getting off, I knew that there was some sort of uh, nonsense going on as far as the government was concerned. What I wasn't expecting was to get wrapped up in the actual personal stories of all of these survivors. That's a really interesting point that you bring up, because what's haunting me, you know, I attended Maxwell's bail hearing, and what came up in that was that the FBI called her and told her that she was under investigation when Epstein was arrested. So who else gets that kind of treatment? Do you remember anyone else? No, no. And that's the thing. I'm talking when when we have the federal government go after you in the capacity that they're going after Jeffrey Epstein before he passed away and now Ghislaine Maxwell and the rest of the criminal enterprise, usually it's a full out, full court press, every tool in the toolbox, and they leave nobody standing. And that includes your family and your loved ones. But in this case, that never occurred. And that's what got my mind going and what really brought me into the fray, because I knew that there was something severely wrong if people that I love are going to prison for seven, 10 years for so-called illegal gambling, but a man running a sex trafficking scheme gets 13 months and the non-prosecution agreement, I knew something was wrong and I had to shift from my usual sports gambling nonsense and move over and take a look at what was going on here. You bring up RICO charges. Why isn't this a RICO case? Uh, You know, Roberta, it's baffling to me. I mean, you, you know as well as I do, obviously better than me. This is what you do. You're a true crime reporter. You know, you look at the R. Kelly case and you look at Nexium and they're both, it's littered with RICO charges. But all of a sudden, Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, and some of the most powerful people in the world are somehow able to duck, dodge, and dive away from RICO. It just doesn't sit with me right. And who are the characters in this that we don't hear about that you think that are important? Well, I think that one of the most important people in this whole entire sordid affair that doesn't get nowhere near enough publicity is Jean-Luc Brunel. I think that Jean-Luc Brunel played a critical role in this case. And when I explain it to people, I know it's kind of uh, basic, but here's the way I like to explain it to people who might not understand. You have Jeffrey Epstein as the so-called boss and Ghislaine Maxwell in the same capacity. You could switch them around, in my opinion, 1A and 1B as far as the boss, right? So if we were looking at it as like a mafia family, you would have the godfather, the underboss, and then the third would be Jean-Luc Brunel. He would basically be like the consigliere of this group. I'm sorry, can you explain to my audience who Jean-Luc Brunel is? Absolutely. He was a modeling agent and a friend of Jeffrey Epstein. Him and Jeffrey Epstein went into business to create the modeling agency, MC2. But before that, Jean-Luc Brunel was a big-time modeling agent uh, in Europe, in America. And all the way back in the 80s, he was under allegations of this sort of behavior, rape and drugging girls and uh, coercing them into having um, sexual activity with him because of what he could provide them. And he came into Jeffrey Epstein's atmosphere And they became fast friends. Obviously, they had the same sort of proclivities. And he became a very good friend of Jeffrey Epstein's as well as a business associate. And he brought over, I I mean, honestly, I don't have the exact number, right? Because who does at this point? But from everything that I have researched and from everything that I have learned, hundreds of girls from other countries were brought into Jeffrey Epstein's atmosphere by John Luke Brunel. 
And he is somebody who has evaded capture. He has evaded the spotlight. And one of the sticking points and the biggest problems with him, I think, is that he's a French citizen. And as you know, there's no extradition treaty with France. Okay, this is my next question. Why did Maxwell not flee to France? I think that's a a good question, and I think the answer is they were on to her for quite some time because, as you know, it was a grand jury um, investigation that provided this indictment. So there was probably a sealed indictment that was sitting there just waiting for them to unveil it, and they probably had her under surveillance as far as her passports and stuff like that. That would be my guess anyway. I don't know for sure. Again, I I don't have that information for sure. But that would be my guess, that they had her under surveillance and they had an idea on where she was going to go. And her lawyers knew that would be my guess. You reported on some very interesting news as far as Maxwell's lawyers and their strategy uh, being turned down by Judge Nathan. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So they they're trying everything in the book, right? And they'll do anything to try and hit the brakes on this case, especially the deposition coming out. That is the last thing that they want. They know it's going to be explosive. And it's one thing for you or I, as people covering the case or reporters in your instance, telling people about this. It's another thing for people to see it themselves on the page. So what they did, the lawyers said they had this new critical bombshell information (laughs) that was going to make it impossible for the documents to be released in the other defamation case. And they were crowing about that for quite some time. And then yesterday, Judge Nathan slapped them with another fat L and told them basically to kick rocks. And what do you think with Maxwell, after her father died, she got involved with Epstein. What do you think the attraction was? She had all the money in the world to go to parties and sort of be a socialite for the rest of her life. I mean, why? Yeah, it's a a good question, right? It is really at the heart of the situation. Nobody really knows the exact nexus of their relationship, right? In my opinion, what I think occurred was, if I could just backtrack for a second, we know that Robert Maxwell, Ghislaine Maxwell's father, was very, very, very adept at spycraft. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are people that say he was attached to multiple intelligence agencies around the world, all the way from Russia to Israel to the United States. So when you have someone like Ghislaine Maxwell, who is Robert Maxwell's favorite child, favorite daughter, she's learning at his knee, right? Where you or I would be learning the basic things about life, how to be a good person, how to be compassionate, et cetera, et cetera, from our parents. Well, she was learning from a master spy. And in my personal opinion, I think that she was groomed for this from the very beginning, like Cersei Lannister was groomed by Tywin. That's a good point. You know, in the Nexium case, Claire Bronfman just wrote a letter to the judge. Basically, she's saying, I'm a sociopath, and this is the first time I got to use my money to hurt people and really hurt people and make myself feel powerful. And I thought about it in terms of Maxwell, you know. I think this is obviously a pedophile, likes control, likes hurting people, has the sadistic streak. But what are we looking at here? Are we looking at an intelligence operation? I don't want to get too much into speculation. Are we looking, is this, was this an intelligence operation? Was this a blackmail operation? From everything that I have compiled and all of the information that's available to us, and remember, that's very critical. We're, we only have so much information available to us, right? And I have covered, I think it's 648 articles at this point. So we have really, we've, we've dug deep into this specific question. And for, for my money and from where I'm sitting, there is no way that this was just happenstance, that Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein met by accident, and they both happened to have the same proclivities, and they both just happened to have the ability to gain access to so-called polite society to help move forward this criminal enterprise. I believe that it was not a coincidence. I believe that they were set up by whoever it may be, whoever was in charge of this operation. And I think that once that they were set up and put together, that we see the whole entire thing bloom right before our eyes, right? We have her, who is the vehicle to so-called polite society, the so-called socialite that Jeffrey Epstein could use as a conduit to invade that part of society. And once there, well, we, we know that these rich so-called members of polite society are a bunch of twisted people anyway. 
They find out what Jeffrey Epstein's offering. He has this island of sin. Why wouldn't they want to go hang out with him? But what they didn't know is that he was filming everything. There were cameras in all of his properties, every room, and all of this stuff was being filmed so that he would have the ability to put people under his thumb and coerce them into whatever the hell it is that his handlers wanted him to have them do. And as far as what that might be, I have no idea. But what I will say is this, there are a lot of people, and I would say a majority of people, who are under the impression that it, it was the Mossad who was in charge of an intelligence operation like this. And while I will say this is a Hallmark style Mossad operation, but they pull off in the Middle East all the time and elsewhere, there is no such operation occurring in the United States without the CIA signing off on it, point blank period. And I know you interviewed Maria Farmer, and she felt that the FBI was at least sympathetic to, at the very least, to Epstein. What are your feelings? I mean, I guess we covered that a little bit. Yeah, I think that the rank and file agents at the FBI are good people, right? They just want to see justice. They compile their cases, and then they shoot it up the tiers so that their boss can sign off on it. And I think what happened at the FBI is that you had good agents on the ground who wanted to get things going and wanted to prosecute this and wanted to make things right. But just like Maria said, the guys on high, the honchos, the bureaucrats, well, those are the guys that have political aspirations and they're playing the long game. So it's all about the means justifying the end to them. And if this was an intelligence operation, the last thing any of these mid-level bureaucrats or even all the way up to the attorney general's office, the last thing they want to do is upset the people at the CIA, the spooks, right? That's not a good idea for people. And you talk about polite society, and you call uh, Prince Andrew the Joe Exotic of the Windsor family, which really makes me laugh. What did you think of that interview? What was your reaction to it? Oh, my, I was blown away. The original interview with Emily Maitlis? Yes. Oh, I was blown away by it. I mean, you could tell just watching it that the guy wouldn't know the truth if it fell out of the sky and smacked him square across the face. I mean, it was an absolute joke watching him. And to see the narrative that he was trying to spin to us and think that we were going to eat up hook, line, and sinker, it's mind-boggling that these people truly believe that that's going to work anymore. The days of the legacy media pushing the narrative of these so-called elites is long over because of people like you who are really getting down into the weeds, Roberta, and challenging the narrative. And what did you think of Emily Mateus? I mean, what I'm hearing is you thought she was very soft on him. Yeah, well, I don't know if I, if I would say soft, but I guess we have to kind of respect the position she's in, you know, working for the BBC. I guess it has to be a bit of a tenuous situation interviewing the Prince of England. So I give her a little bit of slack for that. And I thought she did a good job with the interview, no doubt about it. But I think that he could have been pressed on a few more matters. But again, you know, take my opinion and $1.50 down to the corner store and you can get a cup of coffee, you know? What's so amazing about that interview is I don't think there's ever been a more disastrous interview. I mean, the only thing I think can come close is maybe Whitney Houston's crack is whack, but it didn't have any of the same dakes, you know. And he thought he did great. He told, I think his mother or his crew, that he nailed it. Yeah, he really thought he did, uh, you know, the Lord's work during that interview. <laughs> he thought he did a great job. <laughs> Meanwhile, the rest of the world is sitting there slack-jawed, rolling their jaws back up off the floor after listening to it. What's so amazing to me is that no one believes him. No one. I, I've just never seen anything like it. I mean, you'll find people who still think Liberace isn't gay. But this, it was so clear to everyone saw the same thing. It was, it was quite amazing. And I, I see him as above the law. Do you disagree or agree? No, I agree with that. I think that if anybody in this case is going to be able to find a way to wiggle out of criminal liability, it'll be Joe Exotic of the Windsor <laughs> family. Even though he's a goofball, right? Even though he is absolutely touched, and I'm being kind when I say that, he is royalty, right? The queen's favorite son, and the queen exerts a lot of power in the United Kingdom, unfortunately. But what I will say is this, no matter what, even if he finds a way to get out of criminal charges here, I don't think his life is ever going to be the same. I don't think he's going to be back in polite society, and I think he's going to be too toxic 
for anybody but his gun runner buddies from like Uzbekistan to hang out with. So uh, effectively, I think Prince Andrew is pretty much over. And that brings me to Alan Dershowitz. Have you read his book, Guilt by Accusation? Uh, You know, I I suffered through it (laughs) and I forced myself to read it. And that's coming from somebody, by the way, you know, just to be clear, I'm not an advocate of the Me Too movement. I'm an advocate of following the evidence, right? So it's not like I have some like predetermined hatred of Alan Dershowitz. In fact, going into this Jeffrey Epstein case, I had a lot of respect for him as a, as a, a lawyer. I thought he was, you know, top notch at what he did. But once I started digging deeper into this knucklehead, and, you know, reading this type of things that he's said in the past uh, about these survivors and the way he put his fingers into the case. It's just absolutely disgusting to think that this guy is still given a platform. Do I have it right that he wrote himself into the non-prosecutorial agreement in Florida, that he's part of that? It says all named and unnamed possible participants. So that would mean him, right? Oh, okay. When you have lawyers like Gerald Lefcourt, Alan Dershowitz, and Kenneth Starr leading your defense, you know right away that there is some legal loophole jumping occurring behind the scenes. He always brings up Virginia Dupre. He's in litigation with her, but never Sarah Ransom. Where is the press on Sarah Ransom? I I brought this up, um, I don't know, maybe a month ago on Twitter. And I posted an article from Harvard that talked about the Sarah Ransom allegations. And I agree. I think it's very important that they're brought up as well, because it's one thing when it's just one person making an allegation. Now we have, you know, that there could be gray area. There could be he said, she said. Not that I think there is when it comes to Virginia and Prince Andrew. I've been pretty clear about that. I I believe that Virginia has been very credible throughout this whole entire thing. And I think for her to be able to remember all that she has after the trauma that she's been through is pretty amazing, to be honest with you. I just had such tremendous respect for her after reading her deposition. And, you know, I did a small episode about it. It's just incredible. I've read a lot of depositions, but that was a particularly vicious one. I think Menninger, Maxwell's lawyer, thought that it would be enough that she would be off by a year. (laughs) You know, that's kind of... I agree. That's what they think. And and you know what it is, really, Roberta, what it comes down to? And I try and stress it. And again, I am not a lawyer and I am not somebody who has followed legal cases like this besides organized crime cases. But it is quite obvious that there is some goofbaggery going on here. What do you mean by that? The way that Alan Dershowitz defends himself in public is just absolutely unacceptable by any stretch of the imagination. Does he have to be so demeaning? For somebody who is so educated and somebody who believes that they have the truth on their side, wouldn't you just walk into the FBI's office, go under oath and get this all over and done with? What is he waiting for is really the question. Doesn't he say he went? Didn't he say he he volunteered himself and he went in and what he says and what happened is just really strange. And the fact that he's, can you talk a little bit about what's going on with him and Wexner and that relationship, him trying to get Wexner deposed? Yeah. So according to uh, Alan Dershowitz, he is saying that Virginia Roberts and her law team tried to extort Les Wexner. So he's trying to get Les Wexner and Les Wexner's lawyer, I believe his name's Zenger, Zenger, something like that. I think Ziegler. It's something, something like that. John Ziegler. Yeah. So he's he's trying, uh, Dershowitz is trying to get both of them deposed and he wants them deposed as in live in-person questions. Wexner has offered to give a written deposition from everything that we have heard. But the crux of it is that Wexner is denying that any extortion ever took place, and so is his lawyer. So I don't know what Dershowitz is angling for here. I don't know what he's trying to do, what he's trying to accomplish. And the only thing that I can come up with is that he's trying to move the spotlight off of him and on to Les Wexner to give him more time to kick things into gear. Yeah, it was very interesting what Virginia Roberts' lawyer, Virginia Roberts Dufre, we can use those last names interchangeably, but she said, with, look, anyone in the, depo- uh, in, the, in the telephone hearing, in the Zoom hearing, the last one, she said, look, if you get Wexner deposed, anyone involved in the Jeffrey Epstein story is going to lie under oath. And that's what her contention was. That's what Dershowitz wants, is Wexner to lie under oath so he can say, look, 
This never happened. See, Jufre is a liar. Basically, he wants backup. And he's also claiming that <laughs> defense privilege, he does, loves to do this, calling uh, lawyers up and then using it to his advantage. Can you talk about what happened with David Boyce? Yeah, David Boyce. Boyce yeah. and Alan Dershowitz to get him thrown off as Virginia Giuffre's lawyer. So these guys, they've been contentious with each other going all the way back. I believe it started with the Al Gore election in 2000. Mm -hmm. And they've been contentious with each other for quite some time. So what Dershowitz was trying to do was to get boys off the case to try and get himself into a better position to win, right? So he claimed that boys made statements and boys was involved with Virginia in this whole extortion plot, et cetera, et cetera. And then eventually he, he sued boys for, I believe it was defamation. So boys and Schiller had to vacate the case that they were defending in the, def the defamation case with Virginia, and they had to kick it over to Chuck Cooper. And what do you know about Chuck Cooper? Uh, I know he's a great trial attorney, according to everything I've read, and that he's not a guy that messes around. So I kind of think this might have backfired a little bit on, on uh, Mr. I Kept My Underpants <laughs> On. Yeah, it is really incredible because you're right. He did have a great reputation as a great legal mind. I think what he's when he calls Virginia Jeffre all these names, I think what he's really saying is I can't believe this class of person, let alone a woman is bringing me down and he always talks about his legacy. He will be fighting for his legacy blah 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 blah, but he's really pretty much ruined. I mean he talks about not being able to go to Martha's vineyard and you know and he's been kind of cast out of elite society. Do you think he feels that by giving these interviews he's going to talk his way back in? You know, I think at this point he's so bought in that he can't stop. I think that he is so invested at this point that he knows he has to go all the way. And the funny thing is, I think that Dershowitz, his biggest fear is discovery in one of these cases. The last thing he wants is for that discovery to start to occur and for the information to start coming out. And you see it every time you hear something new about this case. It seems like he goes off the wall and sends out some sort of unhinged tweet and seems to dig the hole deeper for himself as far as the public is concerned. So I don't know what his strategy is. He might be a little bit rattled because, like you said, at Martha's Vineyard, he's no longer invited to the naked volleyball game. <laughs> but I, you know, besides that, I don't really know what's going on with this guy. I don't know if you're aware, but in the most recent filings by the state in the Nexium case, Keith Ranieri was looking to get Alan Dershowitz to help him. I saw that. <laughs> and it, it just, that just goes to show you the sort of person Dershowitz is. If Keith Rainieri knows that you go get Dershowitz to pressure these people, then folks, it's common knowledge in so-called polite society. Right. Uh, and, and, and Jason Flom is the, of, the, of the wrongfully convicted podcast is another one Keith Rainieri wants to help him out. So, you know, I guess that's where you go if you're guilty. So... Who else do you think should be arrested and who do you think will be arrested? I don't, I don't want to get too speculative, but I guess maybe the better question is who do you think should be arrested and why or indicted and why? I think at this point, I think we're pretty sure to see the indictments of who I call the core four. And that is the lieutenants that were working beneath Ghislaine Maxwell, Sarah Kellen Vickers, Leslie Groff, Adriana Ross, and Nadia March, uh, Marchenko. So those are the four that I think have sealed indictments with their names on them already. Now, as far as when they're going to be arrested, I don't know. But any one of those four or all four of them could possibly be speaking with investigators right now. Because as you know, the prosecutors came out recently and said that the grand jury was still active. This was still an active investigation and to expect more indictments. So from where I'm at and the position where I'm in and all the information that I have researched, it can't be anybody else but one or all of those core four next. Taking an, another little avenue, Jeffrey Epstein was very interested in science. And oh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that and what, what do you think that interest was about? Well, I, I think people are always talking about Jeffrey Epstein was like this smart guy, et cetera, et cetera. From everything that I've found out from the people I have talked to that know him, he was a pseudo-intellectual. 
he really wasn't this like great science mind, right? He had some ideas, but he had what a lot of these scientists need, and that's money. So Jeffrey Epstein was able to buy a lot of influence amongst these scientists. And also, let's be real, most of these scientists were pretty dorky their whole lives, right? They weren't, you know, girls weren't throwing themselves all over them. So they meet this Jeffrey Epstein guy. They're into, they're introduced to him by John Brockman or wherever it may be. And next thing you know, they're on this island with all of these Eastern European girls and these young girls running around, and they think they've hit the jackpot. And Jeffrey Epstein, he had a lot of interests in weird, crazy shit like DNA and seeding the population with his seed and just all sorts of far out stuff. And you look at some of the scientists that he was giving money to, and a lot of these guys are involved in like AI and all sorts of crazy, wacky stuff. Right, Marvin Minsky and... Uh... I've heard Epstein wanted his penis frozen and his head frozen. Do you know what happened to his body? I have no idea what happened to his body. As far as I know, it was cremated. But I don't know. Like like I said, I'm not the kind of person that runs around and acts like I know what I don't know. If I don't know, then I don't know. And I won't even speculate. Like, is he buried? Maybe. Is he cremated? They said he was cremated. But in le- I, I go by the old Italian adage – until it's in my palm and I can crush my hand over it, I don't believe it. So it, it's hard for me to even know one way or the other if he was buried or cremated because his brother and the estate hasn't released any of that information. And what do you think about the suicide versus a murder theory? Well, I'll tell you what. If you look at the facility he was in, MCC, and you look at its history, it's not a place where suicides usually occur. It is not a place where it's like a a big problem. Now, don't get me wrong. The place is a dump. It's absolutely not the kind of place I would want to spend even one second in. But that doesn't mean that people are killing themselves at a huge rate. I mean, El Chapo is there. Uh, Keith Rainieri is still there, if I'm if I remember correctly. No, uh, you know, you have a lot. He's in a different he's not prison. There? No, different oh, prison. I'm, but I'm they're sorry. so close in name. I get them confused myself. So like either way, one letter off. <laughs> yeah, they've held <laughs> some really high profile people. Mm-hmm. So I think it's for people to be like, oh, yeah, it's good. It's a suicide. I think that's a little premature. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say it was guaranteed somebody murdered him because I don't have that information either. What I will say is this. There are a lot of coincidences in the official narrative that they would have me believe. And to tell you the truth, I'm not interested in listening to Bill Barr's narrative when it comes to this case. I need to see evidence for myself and the fact that the cameras weren't working, evidence was misplaced. They put him in a jail cell with uh, Nicholas Tartaglioni. There's just a lot of things that did not add up when this all broke and still do not add up to this day. We haven't even received any information to confirm their narrative. All we have are, believe me, because I've told you so's. Good point. Who is Darren Indyke and Richard Kahn? Darren Indyke was Jeffrey Epstein's in-house lawyer, and Richard Kahn was a uh, an accountant. And they were very, very close to Epstein and his organization. In fact, Indyke was involved in just about every transaction Epstein was involved in as his in-house lawyer. As you well know, a lot of those transactions get run by him, right? He's the guy that sits around and any kind of legal question that pops up, he's the guy that Epstein goes to first. He's his number one guy. And if if stuff has to be escalated, obviously, Epstein had the money to go up above him and get in guys like Dershowitz. But for the day-to-day operations, for the legalese of the enterprise and for Epstein's own whatever the hell he had going on, That was in Dyke's role. He played that role to a T, signed off on things, was involved in getting loans for, uh, you know, Nadia Marchenkova, all sorts of stuff. He was very much involved. And Khan, on the flip side, was involved as an accountant, not as much as in Dyke, but still very much involved. And they both obviously became the executors of the estate after Epstein was after Epstein died. Can you talk about the investigation going on in the Virgin Islands? Yeah, there's uh, in the Virgin Islands, you have a civil suit that has been filed, a, a civil RICO suit, basically. And this suit is against Darren Indyke and Richard Kahn and the estate. According to Denise George, the attorney general in the Virgin Islands, the estate 
was part of the criminal enterprise, meaning the people who were running the estate. So talk about a conundrum, right? The attorney general is basically saying that the executors of the estate were complicit in the actual victimization of these survivors. So how in the hell can they even be involved in the estate? And I think she makes a good point. Yeah, she recently just got them to open up the documents, so... She requested that um, Judge Preska give her access to the sealed deposition because she believes it can move her case forward. Now, I'm not sure which way Preska has went with that. I haven't heard if she um, granted the request yet or not. But I know that stuff like this happens all the time when it comes to the feds, and they're in constant contact with these kinds of cases. So I wouldn't be shocked if she gets a little sneak peek. And, you know, I was talking to... um one of my true crime friends and I was bringing up just how interesting it was that Andrew Jarecki and his father Henry Jarecki were friends of Epstein and she said something very interesting she said well you know I I don't really like that guilt by association thing nope me either (laughs) right and I was saying well look you know I mean why make capturing the freedmen's why make a you know why get start a campaign for um, guy who pled guilty to sexually abusing kids and wanting to absolve him and leave out a whole nother defendant when you make a doc, you know, leave so much evidence out of the documentary, it just seemed to me all of kind of a piece. So my question is, could you be around Jeffrey Epstein and not know? I think it would depend on your level of relationship with him. Now, if you're at, if you're at this guy's house all the time and you guys are all hanging out, you're, you're visiting his, his uh, other residences, then there's no way in my mind that you didn't know something was off. But if you happen to be at a party together and you were sat at a table, you know, I'm not making that leap. I'm not the kind of person that's going to make the leap. I'm a believe all evidence guy. And I have levels to this, right? There's a certain level that makes you really involved, right? If you're Prince Andrew, you're Marvin Minsky, you're Glenn Dubin, you're George Mitchell, one of the guys that has been directly implicated in the abuse, then that's one level. And then the next level for me are the enablers, the people that were around Jeffrey Epstein that helped him be accepted in so-called polite society to build this reputation. And those people are responsible as well for helping him with the enabling. But I don't know how we could make the leap that they were involved in any sort of actual abuse, right? Just because they were friendly with him. Like, for instance, this is a good example. Jess Staley. He's a banker, the head of Barclays, used to be in charge of J.P. Morgan. Now, he's never been implicated in abusing anybody as far as around Jeffrey Epstein. But he was Jeffrey Epstein's banker at J.P. Morgan for all of those years and stayed friends with him afterwards. So that's what I call an enabler. Very good point. And what I noticed was that there was so much outrage among the the general popul- populace, but not among the, I, I don't know what you would call it, our government officials. Trump is wishing Maxwell well. Not much outrage. No, the aristocracy as a whole has been pretty silent. And I think the most telling fact was when it all happened, Nancy Pelosi's daughter stated very clearly, a lot of our faves are going to be caught up in this. So I don't know about you, but I don't have any faves as far as politicians go. I mean, you know, those the, the days of hero worship ended for me when I was a child. So there's not, I, I understand what the real world is and the reality of the real, real world. And I understand that people in general are gray characters. So to say, oh, our faves are going to be caught up in this is just a tell right off the right, right from the jump that you weren't going to see much movement from a lot of the, the elite. My question is, how many more Jeffrey Epstein's are there out there? A lot. I mean, I I think that's just the the simple answer. And I'm a neophyte when it comes to this topic overall, the trafficking topic. I never really, until this case, I never really dug into it. I was always more focused on um, sports wagering and Mideast politics, uh, Near East politics. So this was never even something that I thought about. But as you start reading about it, you start talking to people who have experienced it, and you start really, really diving in, you understand right away that this is a huge problem, and it's modern-day slavery, and it's unacceptable. 
Yeah, I appreciate a lot the way the way you talk about it. Do you, you know, you keep your email address. You, you say it at the end of every episode. What kind of emails do you get? You know, you'd be shocked. Uh, a vast majority of the emails I get are people who are supportive of the podcast. I would think with such a divisive issue that I'd be getting a lot of more emails from people who are pissed that I'm talking about insert politician here. But what I try to do is I, I keep my own, my personal politics out of my podcast and I just eviscerate anybody who's involved. So if you were named in those documents as an abuser or you've been an enabler and your name comes up in these media documents, I'm going to go for the gusto and eviscerate you no matter what. And that's just the format that I've had from the very beginning. So I think that I think I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think a lot of people appreciate that outlook when we're living in such a polarized society. You know, it's OK to have political opinions, right? But do you have to drag your personal politics into everything, even your work? I don't think that that's acceptable. And I try to stay away from that as much as I can. Yeah, I think that it's an important thing to do. I, I know I, I don't always succeed, but I, I do try. Um, my question, I guess, is what would justice look like, you think, for the survivors in this case? You know, I, I would never even attempt to speak for the survivors. They're, you know, they, they're all varied and they all have their own experiences, their own stories. But for me personally, and that's the only person I ever speak for, I think that Justice in this case is Maxwell, obviously she's arrested, the core four, and Jean-Luc Brunel at the very least going to prison. I think that is at the very least, I think that's the baseline for justice in this case. And if we wanted real justice and we wanted to show the world that we truly do not have a two-tier justice system, then all of those people who have been directly implicated in abusing Virginia and others would go to trial they would have their shot to you know, plead their innocence, and then after that trial, they would go to prison as well. That would be true justice. But as you know and I know, not all stories have happy endings. So what's getting missed? What is the mainstream media missing about this story? I think the most important thing that they're not diving into is the fact that it's obvious that these people were being protected by some sort of intelligence apparatus. And the legacy media refuses to dig deep. They'll talk about all sorts of other conspiracy type stuff if it fits their narrative, if it helps them politically. But what they won't do is they won't take the chance of agitating some of their so-called faves by digging deep. I mean, don't you think the Clintons warrant a deeper dive by the legacy media for their relationship with Jeffrey Epstein? I most certainly do. And that's not a political statement. That's a statement of somebody who has researched this case. And I have to tell you, Bill Clinton has done nothing but lie every time he's been approached about it. Has he? I, I'm, I'm not even aware that he's been approached about it. When has he been questioned about it? Well, let, we'll just start with the, well, not directly, his, his people, of course. We'll start with the first, the most glaring inaccuracy stated by Bill Clinton. Oh, I've only been on that plane four times. What? Oh, right. Right. 26 times, my friend. <laughs> That's right. At least. Mm -hmm. OK, here's another one for you. I've never been to any of Epstein's properties just the one time. Well, you were at Zorro Ranch for sure. I went there myself and spoke to sources. They saw you, bro. So you can't tell me you weren't there. That's another lie. So you see what I mean here? If it was anybody else, they would be all over it. But because they don't want to give political ammunition to the other side, they refuse to do their job. And it just, it agitates me. And the other side does it as well. So it really bothers me. And that is exactly why I've tried to be pretty neutral here. I'm trying to be Switzerland as much as I can. And what do you think about Maxwell? Is she going to go to trial, you think? I, look, here's the thing. I think that Ghislaine Maxwell is going to talk. I think that she's probably already talking. The question becomes, what can she give up? What does she have that the feds want? Now, could it be Prince Andrew? Could it be Bill Clinton? Could it be Donald Trump? Who knows? And if she has something that the feds want, they will talk to her, as you well know, and she might get herself a little bit of leniency. But I, I, I don't see any scenario where Ghislaine Maxwell doesn't do at least 15, 20 years here. Because remember, we only have these first four charges so far. We haven't seen a superseded indictment yet. And we know that's definitely going to come at some point. 
and the RICO charges are not far behind. The second someone else gets arrested, it is now a conspiracy. This is really interesting to watch. Is there anything that, that I missed that we should talk about? No, I think that's a pretty good uh, overall look at what's going on so far and uh, a basic cliff notes se- uh, session of, of, of where we're at. I mean, this case changes daily, and that is why I have to cover it the way I do with two episodes a day. Because if not, and we say we miss a day or two, who the hell knows what the heck we're going to miss at that point, considering how fast and furious these rulings are happening. Because remember, we're talking about, what, three, four different cases going on concurrently if we're adding in the um, the civil portions of this. So it's a lot to keep up on. And especially when you're just a run of the mill moron like me who doesn't have a law degree, you got, you have to, you know, really keep your P's and Q's going here. You're uh, your ducks in a row. And where can people find your podcast and find you? Yeah, I'm on Spreaker. It's the home. This is the same place where you are, in fact. And the only social media that I really have is my Twitter handle. And you can find me there at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. You know, this really isn't like a project for me where I went into it, like, you know, with all sorts of like uh, polish on it and, you know, editing or anything like that. I don't do anything like that. This My whole podcast is raw and visceral. Everything that you hear on that podcast, I don't even read those articles prior to reading them on air. I just jump in and we go to we go to work. So I'm not here to, you know, the most important thing for me really is that these survivors get some justice and our government gets a kick in the ass for what they did. All the other stuff, selling books, writing books, that's not for me. That's not the kind of person I am. And in fact, I can't wait for this case to be over so I can start talking about happier things like, you know, the new Game of Thrones show coming out or something. What's going to happen when this case is over? You're going to talk about Game of Thrones? You think you're going to be satisfied talking about Game of Thrones? No, I'm going to move on to some other things, some serious stuff as well. But I've always had this passion for George R.R. Martin's work. And he has this the, – the new series is coming out on HBO. So as a little bit of a passion project, mm-hmm. I'm going to start a podcast on that as well. But my next serious podcast is going to be about unsolved cases, unsolved disappearances, unsolved murders – And the first episode for that new podcast that I have coming out will be out in October, early October, and we'll be discussing the uh, West Mesa Bone Collector. Oh, interesting. Well, this has just been a a, a pleasure. I didn't expect you to talk so quickly. (laughs) I didn't expect it to go (laughs) go by, and I think we got a lot in. Bobby Capucci, thank you so much. I I really enjoy your podcast, and uh, I hope people check it out. Roberta, thank you so much. The feeling is mutual. I really enjoy your podcast as well. I am a true crime junkie. So it is nice to have stuff like that to fall back on when I'm taking my long hikes out in the mountains or climbing and I'm just looking to hit that flow. It's always nice to pop on, you know, a Roberta Glass podcast and get going. Oh, that's too sweet. Thank you so much. All right, Roberta, you have a great week. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Anytime. All righty. Have a good one.